Well, we're continuing our series of the Sermon on the Mount, the, uh, the, the kernel of Jesus' teachings are all summarized in three beautiful chapters in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Today's talk is about forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiveness and reconciliation. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. I'll read the text now from the New Revised Standard Version. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, and if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there beside the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Now, <clears throat> culturally, to understand that in this era, there was a tradition. The culture had seven major feasts in the year. And it was customary to make peace during the feast. And uh, Jesus, once again, raises the bar. Raises the bar with authority unseen before in Israel. And this is talked about later in, in Matthew. But to contextually understand, the law was so, so revered in this culture. You know, the, the name of God was so holy that to say the name of God, Yahweh, Elohim, you'd be killed. You'd be, well, you'd be excommunicated. You'd be, you'd be cast out because the name was too holy for human lips to utter. And so to mess with the law at all was like sacrilege. You just, you just didn't go there. And yet here's Jesus raising the bar with such authority and as a matter of fact that people were literally shocked. Last week we talked about anger and Jesus, you know, the context was murder. There were six times in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus talks about a law and then raises the bar and, and, and talks about fulfilling the law, not taking away from the law, but fulfilling it, that it should all be fulfilled. And he raises the bar. He changes the paradigm from an outward expression of a sin, murder, to the inward events that occur before that, the anger that burns. So Jesus is preventing murder by, you know, extinguishing the, the flames of anger. So that's last week in a nutshell. So here, now, yeah, and this is another way of saying what I just got through saying. The repercussion was not a judicial execution or a carrying out of a sentence, but it was, it was to mitigate or to, to alleviate the inward suffering that we experience in our lives. So, uh, as mentioned, the cultural norm was to forgive at these feasts. So I, I did something uh, because this is really kind of a psychological lesson. And, you know, Jesus, I see his lessons often as cutting-edge psychology. You know the thing where he said, you know, you, you talk about a sliver in somebody else's eye, but first cast out the beam that's in your own eye? Well, you know, thousands of years later, we call that projection. We project our junk onto somebody else. And if you have something in your eye, it casts a shadow on everybody that you see. Make sense? Brilliant. Transpersonal psychology. Jesus was the first. So I, I, I went online and I looked up, I, God bless Google. I mean, you can find anything there. And you can find good stuff. I found so many really good articles about anger, the effects of anger. And I found a great article by the Mayo Clinic. They know a thing or two about disease and what happens when people are bitter versus when they're a forgiving, loving lot. So, so this is from the Mayo Clinic, and I thought it was excellent, so I, I share it with you. So unforgiveness often leads to bringing anger and bitterness into every relationship and, and new experiences. So it comes with us. It's this thorn effect. If you have a thorn in you, you're going to be uncomfortable everywhere you go. Because it's, it's in you. It's this thing that doesn't belong, and, it, and it's there. What are you going to do about it? You know, that, that book, Untethered, the, the Untethered Soul, you know, that we read about a year or two ago. You go through life kind of 
guarding this little thorn that you got on the side rather than just pulling it out. You just, you get defensive and you protect it, you know, and somebody bumps it and you get, you know, you, you're ready to go to town against that person that innocently bumps into the thorn. Pluck it out. Okay, so unforgiveness often leads to being so wrapped up in the past that you cannot enjoy the present. Has anybody ever experienced that? Where you're just steaming. That, that little, yeah, it feels good, but after a while it just wears you out. You know, let that anger, ugh, let your animal go, is okay, but if it's for a long time, it, it's very detrimental to, to the health. Okay, so, unforgiveness often leads to becoming depressed or anxious. Oh, I don't want to carry this on too long. Uh, or a feeling that your life lacks meaning. I love this one. You feel, with unforgiveness, you feel that your life lacks meaning or purpose, or that you are at odds with your spiritual beliefs. You know, we, we come to church or synagogue or the temple, whatever it is, and we learn about forgiveness, love, peace, joy, but if at the same time we've got this thorn that's PO'd and angry and doggone it, it shouldn't have happened that way. Resentment. There's this turmoil in our head and everything gets a little twisted. And we can, we can easily turn into this hypocrite. You know, we can put on our little saintly smile. <laughs> our little Sunday smile. Isn't everything perfect? Oh, yeah. And then you get out in the parking lot and you lambaste somebody, you know, for stepping, you know, or walking or driving in front of you. So unforgiveness often leads to a loss of valuable, enriching connectedness with others. It just, there's just a barrier there. It, it prevents us from being able to have a great life. Is it just me or does everybody want a great life? I'm not just a good life, I want a great life. Do you, do you ever stop in the, in the middle of the day and just say, what can I do now to have a great day? Have you, have you ever? Uh, your challenge, your mission today. Should you take it? To say, dun, 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 dun. oh, no band today. It was great. But it's to ask yourself periodically, man, what could I do to have a great day? And get a pencil out, write a list. Oh, okay, now I got a two week worth list of things I can do to have two weeks of great days. Awesome. Experiment, play with it. So now we're going to switch it around. What can forgiveness do to you? Again, this is an article from the Mayo Clinic. Well, you, you automatically will have healthier relationships. You won't transfer your stuff onto other people. You won't project it onto other people. You'll take away the mask. You'll take away the filter, and you'll be able to see people for who they are. You'll be able to have an authentic relationship. You know, authenticity, you're not hiding anything. You're not hiding your anger. You're not hiding your wrath. You're able to be transparent. You're able to be open, genuine. That is kind of a foundational thing of having a great life. No hidden agenda. Mm. Greater spiritual and psychological well-being, of course. You know, in counseling, we are taught that when people have a core belief system and the reality in their life is something different, there's a dissonance, there's a problem, there's frustration, there's pain, there's anger, there's, there's conflict. <laughs> so, um, to, to just let go of all this stuff, frees us up to be able to be more pure, more authentic. You don't have to act. You don't have to pretend. Obviously, we're going to have less anxiety, less stress, less hostility in all of our relationships. Our blood pl pressure is going to lower. Awesome, huh? Fewer symptoms of depression. We'll have a stronger immune system. Is that important to anybody? Yeah. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Of course. Forgiveness, reconciliation is healing. 
It's absolutely healing. Jesus is alleviating our suffering with this teaching. This is a great teaching, a great lesson. Obviously, we're going to have improved heart health. You know, when you're, when you're stressed and, and upset all the time, adrenaline flows. I was addicted to adrenaline. I remember I took, I took a test one time at a, at a Stephen Covey First Things First seminar. And they had to take this test. And I realized I was literally addicted to adrenaline. I was like, wow, this stuff's for real. And as I started to make a shift, I started sleeping better. I still don't sleep much, five, six hours, sometimes only four. But I'm usually really, really wired at five or six hours, which is a nice gift. Sometimes I crave sleeping longer, but I feel good enough. But I began to notice a shift. I used to have heartburn pretty bad. I had a hole in my esophagus, you know, and so I changed my diet, tried to let go of some of the stressful things I was doing, and just, just general stress in all. But, you know, there was also a thing in my life where I was living inauthentically. You see, I had this calling in my life to do what I'm doing today, and I had stuffed it. You know that parable of the three servants where they, you know, they're given talents when the master's going away, he gives one ten, he gives another five, and he gives one one, according to their gifts and abilities. One that had ten doubled it, the other that had five doubled it, and the guy that had one was so afraid of blowing it that he dug a hole and buried it in the backyard so he wouldn't lose it. Well, that was me. I had buried my talent. And, and I was frustrated. It wasn't my life. I wasn't happy. I couldn't be completely authentic because I was living a lie. I wasn't answering my calling. I wasn't taking steps in that direction. I felt literally, I don't know how many times I would wake up seeing an eagle in a cage. I felt like that was my life. And I wasn't living my potential. So, as a result of forgiveness, and reconciliation, we have a higher self-esteem. It's just automatic because integrity. I didn't have integrity when I wasn't living up to my calling. Now that I'm living into my calling, I have the opportunity for integrity. Integrity is living up to your core beliefs. Make sense? And of course, the final result is a transformed life. The gift that Jesus is bringing us is a transformed life. You know, we sang the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. As we forgive those who trespass against us, we are automatically and karmically forgiven. We let the other person out of jail, but the reality is we let ourselves out of the emotional jail we've stuffed other people in. You know that whole crazy thing of holding my breath until you pass out. That's moronic, but it's what the ego does, but the ego is not very educated. We got to bring it along. We got to show it a little Christ consciousness and, and let it be dismissed off the throne in our heart and bring Christ into that throne, into our heart. Amen? All right. Oh, last week, this is my dad. Last week I shared a, a picture of this, actually a different book cover, but this is the book cover of my dad. And I just wanted to revisit that. There was, was an angry young man, a 16-year-old kid. He was a kid. And he was in jail. And, and he was in his own prison of anger, bitterness. He was, you know, dad told me a lot of stories of his childhood. And they were not happy stories. He was bitter against the rich kids. He was bitter against his parents. He was bitter against a lot of people. He had massive amounts of anger and unforgiveness in his life. And as he matured, he, you know, dad was a maniac when I was a kid. You know, he was a rager. And when he'd lose it, we'd just go run, you know, because you can't reason with a, a junkyard dog when it's doing its thing. You know, but dad changed so much during my life that as a teenager, Dad and I made peace, man. We had a great relationship. We'd hang out in the shop. We'd, we'd wrench on our motorcycles together. Even before I had a motorcycle, I'd put my bicycle upside down. You know those, those uh, stingrays? You put them on the seat and the handlebars. And I, 
lubing my chain, hanging out with Dad, and he's working on these big honking beautiful dressers, you know. But it was great hangout time. So we made our peace. We had a great relationship. As he released and forgave and matured emotionally and spiritually as well. So, and how things ended with my dad and I were great, beautiful, loving relationship. Fantastic. Just an example of being set free, following these principles. Forgiveness, reconciliation. It was, it was awesome. It was fantastic. So takeaways for today. Jesus came to bring us life and life more abundantly. John 10.10. 10. Wow. If we ever for any moment think less of Jesus than we ought. Jesus, a divine incarnation that brought us truth. The Greeks looked at Jesus as the window to seeing God accurately. This window into divinity was Jesus Christ. So if we can take those teachings, understand for what it means today in our lives and apply that into our lives, we can experience an abundant, wonderful, transformed life. And, and Jesus' teachings bring us to a greater level of truth that sets us free. If we apply these principles to all these areas of our life, we will experience freedom, freedom in spirit, integrity, peace. Peace can't happen when we're out of integrity with our own beliefs. It just can't happen. So finally, embrace all things that bring peace, love, and healing. Everything in your life. If there's a sliver, go into your inventory. Look what's beneath that. Where's this coming from? Pluck that sliver. Let it go. Surrender. Find that person that has an issue with you and forgive them. There is a caveat. If it is not healthy for you or that other person to go and reconcile, don't do it. Twelve Steps is masterful at this. Do it in your own heart. Or you can do it with somebody that's transitioned no longer in the body. You can get reconciliation with that person. You can do it spiritually as well. Do your own work spiritually. Even if the person is walking on the other side of this country and in the next, and just challenge yourself to do that. I, ch I, ch I did this with my mother in seminary. I didn't realize I had resentment against my mother in seminary. And I did all sorts of healing work. And within a week, we ended up calling, uh, talking on the phone. I meant to get my dad. Truth be told, mom, forgive me. I called my dad on Fridays between 10 and 11 when my mom was getting her hair done so that I could just talk to dad. It was snowed in that day. Mom picked up the phone just a few days after I had done tremendous healing work. Mom picked up the phone and she was open and receptive to just letting everything go. She, we had an amazing healing experience where we admitted our faults and, and asked forgiveness and just came clean. It was, it was an incredible so I waited, you know, dad was the maniac growing up, and I made peace with him as a teenager, but mom had to wait till I was 50 because I was a knucklehead and I just didn't see it. I didn't do enough inventory. So I, I welcome you, I invite you to do that inventory, find out what's there, pluck the thorns, make atonement with your friend, reconciliation, forgive them. Amen? Let's close in a word of prayer. God, thank you so much for this gift that we have in these earthen vessels, these bodies. Within these bodies is our true essence, that which will last forever, our spirit, our connection, our unseverable connection with you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, that we have this truth through the teachings of Jesus Christ. Thank you that we can find truth in the teachings of the Buddha or Krishna. All these teachings come from you, God, the author and perfecter of all faiths, all religions of the world. God, we are, we are grateful, thankful so much to be alive and aware and as awake as we are today. Bless us as we go forward this day. Thank you, God. Amen.